Well, activism is actually how America got its start. But no struggle was longer or harder than the one to end slavery. Frederick Douglass, the ex-slave turned leader of the abolitionist movement, never lived in Brooklyn. His home was in Rochester and then later in D.C. But some of his greatest speeches were, in fact, delivered here at places like the Plymouth Church. And a new book tells the story of that Brooklyn connection. And here to tell us more is the editor of Frederick Douglass in Brooklyn, Theodore Ham. Welcome to BK Live, sir. Thanks. Good to be here. Thank you for joining us, Ted. So I want paint us a picture here. 1859, whole bunch of speeches he gives here. Why? Why Brooklyn? What's going on there at the time? Well, he had a lot of close allies mm -hmm. in the, among abolitionists in Brooklyn. Um, you mentioned Plymouth Church, mm -hmm. where he frequented. Uh, Henry Ward Beecher was the uh, famous minister from Henry, uh, Plymouth Church. His mm -hmm. sister was Harriet Beecher Stowe. Douglas was close with her. Um, Theodore Tilton, Beecher's right-hand man, was a very close ally of, of Douglas. Um, then some leading black abolitionists of the time, Reverend James and Elizabeth Gluster, who lived not far from here over by Metrotech, uh, they were some of his closest allies, and they were all big supporters of John Brown. Yeah. So that was a, so I traced that, those connections in the introduction. So Douglas had allies within radical abolitionists, but he was also uh, a close um, ally with Lincoln throughout the Civil War. So paint a picture of Brooklyn back in that time. You do a great job of contextualizing it, and even down to the street level, like naming some of the intersections where these uh, events occurred. But Brooklyn, there were these abolitionists who supported him, but they were not in the majority. Hmm. Uh, clearly not. No, I mean, it was the minority within the white population yeah. of Brooklyn, and the, the black population was small, yeah. only about 5,000 around the time of the Civil War. And most, I'd say most of those were uh, pretty actively abolitionists. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was re relative to the size of the population, it was a small population. But yeah. the majority support in both Brooklyn and New York, Brooklyn, of course, was a separate city, right. but with both cities voted uh, against Lincoln. Lincoln lost both cities twice, 1860 and 1864, yeah. but he won up, He won the state of New York because right. upstate was radical. You said, as you mentioned, right. and Rochester now completely was completely yeah. that map because we, we <laughs> yes. sit here now and think, oh, we're so liberal or hip, but that history was not Rochester always what was Brooklyn where it was, was for. Yeah. Rochester was Rochester. where it was for. No wonder. <laughs> now it makes sense that that's where he lived. But there was kind of a free town here, if I'm not mistaken? Well, Williamsburg, and well, and you're, thinking, you're thinking of uh, Weeksville. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, yes, so those, those sort of three locations, yeah. Williamsburg, Weeksville, which is basically Crown Heights, and then downtown Brooklyn over here by Metrotech, okay. um, Bridge Street in that area, so. Okay. But the, the speech you mentioned, the first speech is in 1859, right. and that's on a cold winter night in Williamsburg when one of the few people in attendance was Walt Whitman, and he observed Ooh. Douglas in action. And yeah. Whitman was not a great believer in black equality. He was an abolitionist, but not, there were many different strains of abolitionist, right. um, abolitionism. But he was quite impressed by Douglas. And Douglas what was, was his strain? Did he have the kind of colonize? With, no. Uh, yeah. Um, he was just becoming increasingly conservative. He was, he was, a de he was part of the Democratic Party, I remember. Right. And keep in mind that in this era, the, eight, the like Republicans it. genuinely were the party of Lincoln yeah. coming out of the Civil War. And that's one of Douglas's central messages is try to get the, the, the party to act on right. Lincoln's, Lincoln, yeah. especially after his assassination, right? He right. took on this very evoking Lincoln. Right, he's elevating Lincoln in order to um, to show where Johnson stands, uh, Andrew Johnson right. stands, right. and to say we have to honor Lincoln's legacy. So he, he met Lincoln twice in the White House, and he came back. Um, for the inauguration, Lincoln's second inauguration. Yeah. But he took those few meetings and really blew them up into to really sort of say, you know, there's this great figure, this, yeah. this, this powerful figure. So those are the two figures that he comes back to most frequently in these speeches are Lincoln and John Brown. Yeah. Genre. Well, when we uh, when we hear Lincoln, we have this very immediate picture, and there's also a very immediate picture with Frederick Douglass, but there are no recordings that let us know. And I remember uh, when the Lincoln film came out, 
and uh, the brilliant Daniel Day-Lewis playing him, trying to get the timber of his voice, right. and I hear him talking all this inside the actor stuff. What do we know of Frederick Douglass's voice? Like, he's a legend, but what did he sound like? Well, what was speaking, the feeling? Well, you're, I, this came up in our pre prior discussion, because yeah. John, Le John Legend yeah. is playing him in, right. in Underground. The singer, yeah. John Legend. John Legend. Yes. Speaking Once of legends, Jesus, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he he said that the, he didn't know what Frederick Douglass actually sounds like, but if you read the book, you'll find descriptions of his voice as sonorous, yeah. uh, oh. so full and resonant. Yeah, and he commanded of, the church, right. uh, <laughs> Brooklyn Academy of voice. Music, where he spoke twice. Uh, that both of those are in, in here as well. So yeah. yeah, he really commanded the stage. Even, even the hostile press. I mean, that's one of the things I do also in the book is show the hostility yeah. faced from the Brooklyn. Daily Eagle and other newspapers that were really trashing him or just car caricaturing him yeah. uh, in racist terms. But even so, even at the same time, they were still impressed by his, his oratory and his, yeah. his presence. And one of the things you also see throughout the speeches is, is his, he's funny, too. He's got a great mm -hmm. repartee with his yeah, audience. People in. Right. And speaking of the Eagle, that's what you do for the most part in the book, right? Just kind of show these different um, either bits of, of Frederick Douglass's speeches and then the reactions right. within the news. You're kind of letting the news tell the story. The re yeah, they, they, they're, they're really helpful because they included the reactions. So when there were applause, they would you know, they would note that or cheers or, um, you know, some, someone's calling out good, good or three cheers for, for Douglass and things yeah. like that. So. Uh, yeah, you really you get, get, get the flavor of the time. You see Brooklyn change over the course of the speeches. So the first one's 1859, the last one's in 1893 in Crown Heights, and he gets this hero's welcome. Um, so the, the, you see that Brooklyn has changed, the tenor of race relations has changed over time in that. Why do you these, think these Frederick Douglass has captured so much of the popular imagination from the time of these first speeches in Brooklyn to John Legend playing him <laughs> on a TV show now? Well, he's a great figure. I mean, he's, he's such a, a commanding figure and this, the, the, the head of hair and, uh, you know. Yeah. He's also the most, there's another book came out recently that showed he was the most photographed figure of the 19th century. So we really get this, we have, a, we have the visuals of him and that really yeah. enhances his reputation. But he's just such a he has such wide ranging yeah. skills as an editor, an author, uh, a lecturer, and so on. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a statesman. He, after he moves to D.C., he becomes more involved in Republican Party uh, circles and so on. Holds various official positions. So uh, he had many different phases of his life, and this is one chapter that most people don't know about. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I want to actually quote here, if I may, um, from this review. It is my hope that this book will introduce Frederick Douglass to a generation that could benefit from the example of his clarity of purpose and moral vision. Clarity of purpose. That really struck with me in talking about him and how he resonates now, because I feel like in our current times, yeah. we're dealing with a lot of unification versus factioning and factionism. And I just wanted to hear what you would say about sure. him. And if he were still here at this time, yeah, would That was he, a little bit of yeah. a forward from our brother yeah. president. Current borough president talking about Douglas. Sure. Well, uh, the I mean, the clarity of purpose was to fight for full black equality, and in his moment, and he he also was very attentive to other groups as well. He's one of the first people yeah. to speak out on behalf of Chinese Americans um, who yeah. had come to work on the railroads and being exploited and Exclusion facing discrimination yeah. in, in California, as you know. So. Um, but that's, that's his clarity, that was his single mm -hmm. purpose, and he pushed in mer various ways. He's very strategic about it. And, you know, obviously right now we're in a time when there's a retrenchment. Yeah. The likely to be the next attorney general is someone who sympathizes with con the Confederacy. So, you know, this is just, you know, unfortunate repetition, and we need more people to speak right. out. Right, right. So if he, were, if he were here now, MLK was to <laughs> Malcolm X as Frederick Douglass was to... Uh, well, you could, say, you could say Lincoln. I mean, you could say he was pushing. He, that's really what he was doing throughout the course of the Civil War, pushing Lincoln. Um, and then after, this, after the assassination, really sort of, as we talked about before, just elevating Lincoln in order to get the party to follow through on and protect the rights of blacks in, in Reconstruction and then after Reconstruction, after their retreat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there an heir apparent? You are our Frederick <laughs> Douglass expert. Is there anyone in? Hell, it might be Linda Sarsour. Like mm -hmm. it's could like, be. Yeah, who, yeah. I mean, who is the person who you see that might be in that tradition of a Douglass? 
Well, I, th I think uh, Linus Sarsour, Opal Tometi spoke recently at um, Martin Luther King Day, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter. So I mean, I think there's a whole range of, of new voices on the horizon, and many of the people who are speaking um, with the women's marches, um, Angela Davis is sort of an heir to that tradition. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, I, the one person who came to mind, obviously, who could have played the role that Douglas played with Lincoln yeah. was Cornell West. Mm. And I don't disagree with, I agree with many of his critiques in some, of, of Obama, right. where Obama was his shortcomings on Wall Street and things mm -hmm. like that, immigration. And things, um, but his, he kind of, his reputation was marred by his own personal slight and that yeah. just sort of made people think that it was just a personal grudge and, mm -hmm. and, and so on, so. So, Ted, the book is Frederick Douglass in Brooklyn. You're having a recent conversation about this. Yeah. Soon, an upcoming conversation, <laughs> not a recent Depending one. Depending on when you're watching. Depending right on right where, <laughs> when you watch the show, it could have been recent As or we upcoming. As you right now. Dun, dun. Uh, no, Tell so us about what's coming up. up. Uh, yeah, it's on Sunday at um, Bridge Street, AME. Bridge Street, the original location, is still there yeah. uh, on Metro Tech Plaza. It's owned by NYU. Um, but in the 1930s, Bridge Street Congregation moved to its present location in Bed-Stuy. And so we're going to do a conversation. We're going to have a reading from a performer, a talented performer named T Thomas Saxon Southern. We're going to have a good conversation with Dr. Aubrey Hen Hendricks, a scholar um, cool. of, of African-American cr Christianity and right. protest tradition. Very cool. Excellent. Thank you for this book. It was great. It's a great read. I appreciate it. I encourage it. you Thanks to you. pick it up. So, likewise. Frederick Douglass. <laughs> Hair goals. All right.